Uh, because while you're chatting up this good looking woman, you're standing next to this ugly, weedy, spotty little guy. And in comparison, you're going to look like a big man. Once you get chatting to the woman, you can also start to take the piss out of your friend and start laughing at his spots, boils, and warts. And then again, in comparison, you will look like a knight in shining armour. Sectarianism is the ugly mate of Scottish First Ministers. Except sectarianism is actually an imaginary friend. He doesn't really exist. He might pop his head up at football matches, but as soon as the match is over, he magically disappears again. And there are no pitchfork uh, crowds miraculously <coughs> appearing uh, in the streets of Glasgow. Alex Salmond knows deep down, as I think most politicians do, uh, who have any uh, sense of themselves, that he is an empty shell with very little substance, credibility, or passionate support from the electorate. In fact, as far as I can see, the reason the SNP were elected is the same reason most parties have been elected in the last 15 years. And that is because people were voting against the other lot rather than for the new government. Even where people do vote for people today, again, as far as I can see, it's largely because they think they are the better administrator of services rather than because they have any deep seat of political allegiance loyalty or passion for them. And I think in their hearts, even though they can't admit it, politicians know this. In this context, shouting, I am against sectarianism and bigotry, gives a semblance of grandeur and moral substance to otherwise rather grey, uninspiring men and women in the Scottish Parliament. And of course, shouting sectarianism with a shocked voice, is like shouting, I am against paedophiles. There is no opposition uh, to this shout. In fact, if you looked at the Scottish Parliament, what was interesting in the recent debate there, was that every person, even the people who were against, and especially the people who were against the bill, stood up, and before they spoke, had to sort of doff their cap and say, I too am against sectarianism and bigotry in all its forms. And they feel the need that they have to say this, have to say it, before they say anything else uh, against the bill. It's a bit like being at a Salem witch hunt where you have to stand up and say, I don't like witches, by the way, before you can actually speak. Of course, wherever you have this type of unquestionable mantra, being chanted, you know that it is meaningless. It's more of a kind of ritual uh, to express your goodness than anything to do with tackling real problems in society. But we feel the need to all uh, nod our heads of agreement and mutter the mantra ourselves. And all the people at West End dinner parties can mutter their disgust at the pitched fork carrying mob and feel morally superior. And that's really what the sectarianism debate uh, is all about. This is also why old firm games have been connected to domestic violence, another aspect of the political uh, and police campaign against fans, which is about as low as it gets. Again, we find another ugly mate, the wife beater, somebody nobody supports put together a few statistics, and we have a pitchfork carrying bigoted batterers of women, uh, the perfect bogeyman to stand above and feel like one of the upstanding, right-thinking people of the world. Of course, as I noticed in a, an article I wrote about this, you could find any group where you have a large group of people drinking, uh, where you have tens of thousands of people drinking and domestic incidents uh, will increase. This is what happens at Christmas. This is what happens at New Year. Uh, that's what happens. You could easily, if the police had a massive ball where you had 10,000 policemen, you could find out that the police levels of domestic incidents rose uh, and you could do the same with any group. But you don't. You only do it. You scrabble around for figures for old firm fans to get another uh, correct 
uh, form of vilification of them. So this is what's happened. Old firm fans were artificially constructed as wife beaters. And I think it's uh, illustrative of the extent to which both politicians and senior police officers have gone out of their way and feel totally free to throw any amount of crap at football fans and think they can get away with it. And of course, this level of organized discrimination and vilification, if targeted at, at any other group in society, would have the right thinking people horrified and throwing their arms up in outrage, but not when it is so-called white trash football fans, their fair game uh, for West End dinner parties, uh, the media uh, and the political elites. Just to move on to the be offensive behavior bill, uh, and I think this bill, like bills that have already been passed uh, that target football fans, have, despite all the background noise about violence, which is always a, a thing that's kind of held against people singing songs, has absolutely nothing to do with violence whatsoever. This bill is about words, and that's why it's even more worrying uh, than past targeting of fans that's taken place in the 1980s and 90s. Hamza Youssef, for example, who's the, one of the SMP, MSPs who promotes the bill, he constantly challenges the idea uh, that this bill is just about words. Uh, he argues that actually if you look at the bill, it says there must be incitement to violence. Okay, that's, that's his argument. It's not just words, there must be incitement to violence. I would argue, especially in this political climate that's been whipped up about bigoted fans, this has no uh, serious meaning. And it is basically behavior that right-thinking people, so-called, find offensive, which is going to be criminalized, criminalized, and actually already is being criminalized. If politicians are already being remarkably immature in their dealings with the issue of sectarianism and football fans, this new bill, I, argue, I would argue, goes further along the line of treating fans and encouraging them to act like children who tell tales on one another because they are offended. The interesting thing about the bill, which is, I'd be interested in the discussion about this afterwards, is that it really targets Celtic fans. Because Rangers fans are already screwed. Now Celtic fans, and in fact all other fans who are deemed to be offensive, can potentially end up inside for five years. The Stephen Birrell case, if any of you followed this, uh, is a case in point about the existing law and how it can be used. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, basically, Beryl bad-mouthed uh, fans, Celtic fans online, uh, and because of his previous convictions, got eight months inside. This is something that the Spectator magazine, uh, not the most extreme magazine, just a sort of general uh, run-of-the-mill conservative uh, magazine, made the point that this is one of the most shameful legal decisions in Scottish history. Uh, and I would agree with that. I would quite happily uh, support a campaign to get Beryl out of prison, even though he seems like a bit of a scumbag uh, from his past convictions. Nobody should be being sent to prison at any time, let alone eight months for writing a few uh, offensive words on a website. This is essentially a thought crime, or at least a speech crime. Uh, and there is no incitement here. There's not even a threat. Uh, of violence. Just some nasty words on a Facebook page. Of course, the reason he got eight months is not just because the laws exist, but because the political campaign around the latest bill has encouraged a form of criminal justice frenzy around all things sectarian and bigoted. This has likewise already led to a massive increase in special cameras being used and listening equipment so the police can spy on fans and arrest them later for saying naughty things 
at or around uh, football matches. So what should Rangers fans think about this latest bill? Uh, there's, a, there's a number of options. One option is to say, screw them. To point the finger at Celtic fans and say, you've told on us, now we're going to tell on you. Or, we can all oppose the criminalization of all football songs. At this very moment, and it possibly is this very moment literally, uh, a colleague of mine is talking at the Celtic Fans Against Criminalization meeting and arguing that ne they need to defend your right to singing up, uh, to being able to, your right to sing about being up to your knees in Fenian blood. And you can imagine how well that's going down. <laughs> And I think most of us in this room can have a laugh about that. But, will you laugh now? He is also saying to them, a colleague of mine is talking at a Rangers event at Ibrox about the criminalization of fans and telling them they should argue against the criminalization of fans who shout up the ra. And the Celtic fans will no doubt be having a laugh about that as well. But as long as both sets of fans laugh about this, the real people laughing are Alex Salmond, the police chiefs, and the West End dinner party guests who are mutter muttering under their breath about white scum football fans. So for me, there are two options. Accept the laws as they are, even the latest one, and accept that we're all going to act like offended victims who can't handle a good slagging from our opponents. Accept we are going to cry like babies about being offended. Or we can act like men and stand up for an incredibly important principle, free speech and the right to be offensive. Something that is not a, just a football issue, but is a massively important issue for anyone he wants to live in a free, democratic society. Final thought. I know very little about the history of Rangers or Celtic football clubs, but I was reading this week about the decision in 1952 of Rangers Football Club to defend Celtic's right to have the trickler on the roof of their stand. Uh, there may have been all sorts of reasons for making that decision, but to me, it is illustrative of a principled and also a pragmatic decision. A position that defends other people's freedom, not because you agree with them, but because you know once their freedoms have been taken away, you have no way to defend your own freedom. I think we should take a lead from the decision by Rangers in 1952, and stand up for what is right and what is the, in the interests of all football fans. If we are going to turn the tide uh, of this relentless criminalization of fans, we need to recognize that all fans have an interest in arguing that no fans, not a single one, should be arrested, charged, or imprisoned for singing any song. Thank you. Thanks very much for that contribution, Stuart. I'll uh, get you a little bit of time to get your, your thoughts together. Um, Joanne, if you could mention to the ladies that we'll be doing the teas in about 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, do we have some questions for Stuart and the, the practicalities of the application as well? Yeah, 